Okay, and welcome back, folks. During the break, we left a Slido poll open uh, asking automobile debt comprises what percent of American consumer debt? Uh, so let's see how you did. Jason, if you could share the slide results. Okay, so most of you got it. Uh, so the answer is B, 5 to 10%. Uh, it actually may, comprises 9%, so good job. Uh, so our next session is our session on competition and consumer welfare, subprime auto buyers. And our next moderator is Jose Canal Serta. Jose is a senior special advisor at the Philadelphia Fed in the supervision, regulation, and credit department. His current areas of expertise are financial risk management, financial econometrics, and consumer finance, and he publishes frequently in academic journals in these fields. And he is currently a member of the system FinTech subgroup. Jose also co-leads the supervisory research and policy forum, SURF, at the Philadelphia Fed, which is one of the sponsors of this event. So Jose, you can take it away. Thank you very much, Suzanne, and thank you to everybody uh, that has been part of this conference. It has been excellent so far. Uh, we have our last uh, group of papers, which uh, I expect to be as excellent as the ones that we just, uh, you know, that were just presented. So I'm just going to go right ahead with the, you know, very quick introductions and let the speakers do their job. The first uh, presenter is Anthony Lee Zhang from the University of Chicago, and he will be talking about competition and selection in credit markets. Uh, the floor is yours. Great, um, I'll get started. Um, assuming everyone can see my screen. So um, thanks a lot. It's very great to virtually be here. Um, I'll be presenting a paper that I've co-authored with my colleague, uh, Constantine Yanellis, who is also at U Chicago. And sort of as the session might suggest, the gist of this paper is we want to talk about sort of a kind of counterintuitive effect um of competition in credit markets and so we're going to show you this effect and then we're going to come up with an explanation for why this might be happening so first of all to set the baseline what is competition supposed to do in classic markets right we normally think of competition as a good thing high competition leads to lower prices for consumers right and so let's just quickly look at whether this happens in the auto loan market right so here's a plot of competition and prices interest rates in the prime segment of the auto market so then we're measuring competition at the county year level, and then we're measuring average interest rates. And then we're simply asking the following. If a market gets more concentrated, what's happening to interest rates, right? So here we measure concentration as a standard in any trust settings using the Herfindahl index, right? So what is the Herfindahl index? You can think of it in a symmetric world as one divided by the number of equal sized um, lenders in the market. So basically 0.25, four lenders, five lenders, 10 lenders, something like 20 lenders, right? What we expect is basically more concentrated markets are bad, more competitive markets are good. This is indeed what we see, right? What we see is that when you have roughly four or so lenders for prime consumers, um, interest rates are in the ballpark of five and a half percent. When the market gets more and more competitive, you have lower interest rates. And then there's a rather sizable drop in interest rates of around one to one and a half percent when you get into competitive markets, right? So everything kind of looks good here. Competition is making the market work better. Now we're going to look at the subprime segment. And again, we're just going to show data here, right? And what happens in the subprime segment? The relationship actually reverses. So in the subprime segment, interest rates are a lot higher on average, of course. So they're in the ballpark of 12 to 15%, right? But when you have very few competitors or when you have many competitors, so you have maybe 10 or 20 lenders, you actually have quite high interest rates, something like 14 and a half percent or so, right? And then as we look at more and more competitive markets, um, you actually see interest rates going down, right? Um, the difference again is quite sizable. You're going from something like 14 and percent to something like 13 or 12%, right? And then of course, this is just data, but in the course of the paper, we'll show you various kinds of evidence suggesting that sort of this is not just a correlation, that changes in concentration are gonna causally um, create these asymmetric effects in your prime consumers and your subprime consumers. Okay, so this is kind of weird relative to classical theory. What might be happening here? Here's kind of our explanation for why this is happening. Our explanation is basically that the auto loan market, like many other lending markets, doesn't just involve setting prices. It also involves picking which consumers are supposed to get credit, um, screening out consumers who you don't want to give credit to. 
And then the auto loan market, many other consumer lending markets, is also kind of unique relative to, we think, for example, business lending, in the sense that a large component of the kind of costs that lenders expend to do screening are actually mostly fixed costs, right? So you want to build out infrastructure to um, software or you want to buy data in order to figure out sort of which consumers are worth lending to, right? And then here we gathered a bunch of headlines. Many of you are probably very familiar with these. Um, auto lending involves buying alternative data um, to figure out sort of which consumers um, are worth lending to beyond what credit scores can tell you. It involves building out decision software, building or buying decision software to automate it, to automate loan decision making. It involves in, uh, installing, for example, GPS tracking um, to improve repo recovery rates, right? Sort of relative to the case of lending to a business where you want to figure out sort of how good each individual business is, that kind of looks like a variable cost. Here, we think it's more like a situation in which the lender makes one investment, and then sort of that is going to help the lender screen a relatively arbitrary number of customers. So we're going to, in this paper, construct a model where we combine these kind of two forces, the classic force that competition has and how it lowers sort of markups lenders charge with this force of screening. So we're going to have a model in which lenders are making screening decisions and then setting interest rates, right? I'm going to show that basically there's two counteracting forces, and this is able to match the pattern we see in the data that actually for high risk consumers, it's possible that we reverse the classic result. More competitive markets are worse. More concentrated markets actually lead to lower interest rates. So this is going to be our framework to explain sort of why we think this is going on. Then we're going to show you basically more detailed tests of what we observe in the data and the tests in particular to show that our channel is indeed explaining what's going on. With it. So then first of all, we're going to show that there is a very robust um, correlation in the data um, where sort of the very robust asymmetry where concentration is correlated one way with interest rates for low risk groups, correlated another way for high risk groups. We're going to show that this holds using variation in um, quasi-exogenous variation in market concentration. So we're going to do this by exploiting um, bank market structure shocks. So bank failures and bank mergers as shocks to bank market structure. So we're then going to show some suggestive direct evidence that indeed for a certain kind of screening technology we observe, basically alternative data purchase, indeed lenders in more concentrated markets are actually buying more screening products. So this lends some support for hypothesis for our hypothesis. And then we're going to show that auxiliary predictions of our model on how default rates, loan quantities would behave under this channel also support the fact that it's really the interaction between screening and competition driving our results. All right, so if this is indeed what's happening, what are the implications? I think the simplest way to say this is that from a policy perspective, sort of the simple application of classic competition policy ideas in these lending markets, in these auto lending markets, may not sort of fully fit what's happening here, right? Sort of, it seems to basically work this way in your prime low risk markets, that sort of competition is good, right? But there's kind of a new channel which makes competition not necessarily good in subprime markets. And sort of a simple approach of just saying, let's try and make sure these markets are competitive as possible may actually make consumers worse off. And sort of from the academic side, it's also sort of, we may want to take into account this heterogeneity of the effects of market structure in different segments of the credit market. All right, so jumping in, I'll skip that for reasons of time. Um, before jumping into the math, I'm gonna give a brief overview of what's going on. So then our model basically combines two elements, um, as I mentioned. Um, the first is the relatively standard element of market power. Lenders are able to set prices somewhat above their marginal costs of lending, right? And then sort of how much above marginal costs, the markup that lenders are able to charge depends on how competitive the market is. So this is a standard force. The second channel is screening. So we're going to model lenders as making these fixed cost investments to identify and screen out high risk borrowers. So the basic idea in the model is the following. In more competitive markets, given a level of risk in the population, um, say the default rate is 5%, lenders are going to set interest rates closer to that 5%. So lenders are going to be able to extract lower markups over the break even interest rates, right? So if the break even interest rates were fixed, if default rates didn't change, that would be all that happens. Competition would always be good. However, in more competitive markets, because you have a fixed cost screening technology, you have a smaller slice of the market, it's less worth it for you to buy these screening technologies that lower the level of default risk in the population. So actually when the market's more competitive, lenders also have lower incentives to screen. This means that there's gonna be more sort of high risk uh, borrowers who are likely to default in the population. So the break even interest rate is actually higher. 
And the key is basically that in high risk populations, when default rates are already high and screening is really important, the second effect can dominate. So basically competitive markets can decrease lenders incentive to screen enough that the population becomes sufficiently adversely selected that actually interest rates are actually higher. Okay, jumping into what precisely we're doing. Um, so we have a simple model, there's n identical lenders and we're gonna index them by J. And then we have a unit mass of consumers. We're gonna use a simple model of sort of differentiation and markups, which is the sale up circle. Um, in the paper, we can relax this, we can use a logit. This um, that seems to follow pretty generally from imperfect competition. And we basically have a toy model of um, what the structure of consumers look like. So we have a unit mass of good type borrowers that never default. And then the population has some um, amount of type B borrowers who always default. And then the problem lenders face is basically a two stage problem. First, they can invest in a screening technology um, to screen out type B consumers and decrease the default rates they face, right? And then, so the idea is basically that, so depending on whether um, Q is high, whether there's a lot of bad type borrowers likely to default in the population, screening is gonna be more or less important and expensive, right? So you can think of in subprime, these screening costs are important and also relatively expensive. And then the lenders set interest rates um, at which they're willing to lend to borrowers. Okay, so what do the two forces do? The lender's profits basically are um, my profit is equal to um, the markup of my rate over the break-even interest rate, which depends on the default rate, delta J, multiplied by what my market share is. And so what we show is there's a relatively standard formula for what the lender's optimal markup is. And then that boils down to saying that the markup of the lender depends on two parameters. It basically depends on how price sensitive um, consumers are, and then it depends on how competitive the market is. So then as the number of competitors increases, markups get lower, we get closer to a competitive market where lenders have to set price equal to their marginal costs, which are equal to the default rate. Second channel is that lenders have to pay these screening costs, right? And then sort of jumping to basically the um, expression, what lenders are doing is that lenders are investing in order to um, maximize their profits. This is from the last slide, which is just your market share times your markup minus your screening costs. And the basic idea here is that a investment in screening effectively serves as an investment in cost reduction, right? Because you're taking whatever your consumer faces and then you're lowering the cost of serving it basically, right? And these cost reductions um, are more valuable if you have a larger slice of the market anyways, right? And then what this equation basically says is that I'm gonna invest until the point where the cost of additional screening um, is equal to basically my market share multiplied by an adjustment term. What does this mean? This means that in more competitive markets, I have a lower slice of the market and thus I have lower incentives to screen. Just briefly going over this again, if I am a monopolist, I have a giant slice of the market, my fixed costs are amortized over a bigger population. So they're more worth it, right? So that's basically the channel uh, implying that um, I wanna screen more. Um, I wanna screen less in more competitive markets. And basically these are the two forces that um, compete against each other. One tends to drive prices up, one tends to drive prices down. So the basic idea is that interest rates are equal to the sum of markups and default rates, right? Um, competition decreases markups, but increases default rates. And thus, um, those are two counteracting forces. Let me show you the model in a graph. So here I'm doing basically model versions of the stylized plots that I showed you at the start. So in each of these panels, I'm showing you the Herfindahl index of market concentration. So this way is more concentrated markets, right? When the market is more concentrated, markups are higher, right? Um, I'm gonna set prices higher above marginal cost. When the market is more concentrated, I'm gonna screen more and thus lower the default rate, right? And the important thing to realize here, so here I'm splitting basically different lines represent different levels of population risk. So purple can be thought of as prime, blue can be thought of as very subprime. And the idea of the sign here is that in all markets, even in prime markets and more concentrated markets, I screen more and lower default rates, right? So the sign here is always negative, but the difference is that in subprime populations, the size of this effect is bigger, right? What's the result? Interest rates are the sum basically of your costs and your markups. In the prime segment, the cost channel wins, sorry, the markup channel wins, right? Because default rates are low and insensitive to screening, basically the markup force wins more concentrated markets just have higher interest rates overall. 
But in subprime markets, actually, the screening channel wins. So then even though markups are higher, lenders um, are able to screen more and lower default rates sufficiently that interest rates are actually lower in more concentrated markets. So that's basically a summary of what the model is doing. It's saying that in a market where you're screening and setting these uh, markups, um, either these two forces are counteracting effects on interest rates, right? So then this is able to basically rationalize the pattern I showed you at the start, where um, the effect of concentration on interest rates is asymmetric, and it depends on the level of population risk, right? In the way that we showed you at the start. All right, the model makes two other auxiliary predictions we can also bring to the data. So one prediction is basically that, remember the middle panel, the screening channel has the same effect in terms of sign for both groups. So then higher concentration is gonna lower default rates for all groups, right? Higher concentration, um, it's just that this effect is going to be bigger for subprime groups than prime groups. Second thing is that concentration can cause, in our model, it's possible that increasing concentration can cause loan quantity to, to decrease at the same time that prices decrease, right? So why is this kind of a unique prediction of the model? The reason is because suppose we didn't have screening, right? Suppose the market was a classic market where lenders just set prices. If the lender sets lower prices without any kind of restriction of credit, demand curves slope down, people want to borrow more, right? And so this pattern, which is that quantities are lower and prices are simultaneously lower, um, we think is pretty strong evidence that some kind of screening or credit rationing is happening in the, in, in, it, it, it is happening. All right, with that, I'll jump to what we do empirically. So we're looking at the auto loans market, uh, given the topic of this conference, this does not need much information. Um, one thing that I will point out is that, number one, there's some evidence that the screening investments of the kind that we talk about are actually happening in this market, right? So we highlight predictive analytics, machine learning technology, and AI technologies for um, identifying borrowers likely to default, things like this. The other thing to highlight is that we were surprised, actually, to learn that there is securitization, but the securitization rate in these markets is pretty low. So if you just take the total outstanding volume of auto loan ABS, and divide by the total outstanding amount of auto loans, you get something like 20%, right? So the majority of auto loans are held actually on the lender's books, right? Why is this important? Because um, this suggests that the lenders actually care about um, the default rates on these loans, right? And then so that's what we assume in our model. This seems like 80% close to true in this um, in the setting of US auto lending. Our data comes from, um, like uh, the previous talk, from a credit panel. So we use the TransUnion Consumer Credit Panel. This is a 10% sample of credit records. What we're able to see here is basically we can see interest rates on loans. And then we also observe lender IDs, allowing us to compute concentration um, at the local level. So how concentrated auto uh, lending markets are in different parts of the US. We're going to, for one part, we're going to use bank market share variation. And then we're going to also use some data on bank market shares from the call report. Here's the plot I showed you at the start. I won't go over this in much detail again, except to highlight basically this is the core force we want to study. Higher concentration, lower interest rates for subprime consumers, which is kind of counterintuitive. More concentrated markets, higher rates for the prime consumers. Quickly, I'm going to show you that this result is robust to not just um, bin scattering it, but also regressions. So I'm just going to regress um, interest rates, log interest rates on county fixed effects, time fixed effects, and um, the log of the Herfindahl index um, in a credit score group in an area, right? And then sort of when I do this, what we see is that these three columns have the regression coefficient for subprime consumers. These three columns have the regression coefficient for prime consumers. We have no fixed effects, your fixed effects, county fixed effects, right? So simply in the panel regressions, when markets are more concentrated, interest rates are higher for prime consumers. When markets are more concentrated, interest rates are lower for subprime consumers. And this holds in all the different panel specifications. Let's split into finer credit score buckets. So we did 300 to 600, 600 um, plus. When we split into these finer credit score buckets, we see basically that the relationship, as the theory predicts, is pretty monotone, right? So the deepest subprime um, has a very negative relationship. Concentrated markets seem to actually, more market, more concentration seems to actually decrease interest rates a lot. Less negative, 
slightly positive, slightly positive, insignificant but positive, insignificant but positive. So um, this suggests this relationship looks kind of monotone. Some simple evidence, right? If our channel is really working, we should really be seeing lenders making observably more screening decisions in these markets, right? So one piece of evidence we found on this, we don't have the universe of screening stuff lenders are doing, but we did have get access to data on um, how much lenders are buying this proprietary credit vision product from TransUnion. So um, this is a product which gives lenders um, additional information on consumer behavior and um, credit history. Um, this is an example of what we might consider um, investments in screening costs. And then we can simply ask, our theory predicts that lenders in more concentrated markets should be more likely to buy um, credit vision, right? And then, so what do we find here? When we do a bin scatter simply of uh, market concentration against a fraction of people um, purchasing credit vision, we see that indeed um, in more concentrated markets, a larger share of lenders are actually purchasing credit vision. So that's some evidence that lenders are indeed um, investing more in screening technologies in these um, more competitive areas. Okay, um, another sort of suggested fact that screening is more intense in more concentrated areas. If we simply look at the average credit score of consumers in more and less concentrated areas, Average credit scores are somewhat higher in more concentrated areas, which suggests kind of that whatever lenders are doing on this screening, it's leading to a better selected population in these areas, um, which are more concentrated. Okay, so I will quickly go over um, the bank market structure variation that we do. So then um, what we did is regress interest rates on concentration, um, industrial organization economists, would say you should never do this. You should never regress prices on concentration, which is very market structure, which is very endogenous, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to exploit some arguably quasi exogenous variation in market structure in the auto lending industry, right? And then show basically look for evidence that sort of um, instrumenting for market structure, we still find similar effects. In particular, what we're going to do is we're going to use shocks to bank market structure. Banks are not the only lenders in auto lending markets, but they are one not fairly large set of lenders. So basically bank market structure shocks should also affect market structure in the auto loan market. And then as a simple um, illustration of this, um, if you take um, bank, um, if you take um, concentration in the banking market and plot against concentration in the auto loans market, you see a very positive relationship. So, um, this suggests basically that it's valid to use bank market structure shifts um, as a shifter for auto lending, um, um, auto lending um, uh, concentration. All right, so we're going to use two instruments, both from the literature. Um, one of them is basically exploiting, a cr it's a cross-sectional instrument, exploiting the fact that a few large banks failed during the 08 crisis. So this was used in a paper by Buchek and Joring on the mortgage market in 2021. And then basically in the areas where these large banks fail, post-crisis concentration is lower. And then so the conditions under which this is a valid instrument are that the pre-crisis market share should not be correlated with auto lending rates today, except through effects on concentration. What we find here is the, um, the IV estimates give us a um, asymmetric relationship. So um, higher concentration is associated with negative uh, with 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 decreases in interest rates for subprime consumers and with increases in interest rates for prime consumers. Um, I'll very briefly go over the bank merger design. This is a um, instrument that basically exploits. Let's compare interest rates in a different diff framework for um, counties after it experiences a bank merger and before. Right. This is somewhat underpowered relative to our other design. So the effects on per capita indices are relatively small. Nonetheless, in the reduced form, we basically find that following a merger, it seems like interest rates decline slightly, actually, for um, subprime consumers and stay roughly constant for prime consumers. And then if we split into finer credit score buckets, we sort of see that it seems that there's a somewhat negative effect on low credit score consumers and a more positive effect on um, prime consumers. Okay, two other pieces of evidence. The model predicts that um, concentration should be associated with more screening for both prime and subprime consumers, right? And then if we um, regress default rates 
on concentration, we expect basically this relationship to always be negative, just more important for subprime. And indeed, we seem to find this, which is that um, when you regress default rates, delinquency rates on HHI, you're seeing basically um, essentially negative coefficients across the board in both um, credit score groups, although some coefficients are insignificant. The other regression that we do is we're going to test the quantity prediction of the model. So then in short, without going through this in detail, what we find is that um, increases in concentration decrease loan quantities in a panel regression, even in the groups for which they decrease prices. And again, the logic of this test is basically that um, if we see lowered prices, sort of, if we're moving along a demand curve, we should see higher quantities. If we see lower prices and also lower quantities, it seems like some kind of screening is going on, right? Um, I am essentially out of time. I'll mention briefly that we split by what we um, see as lenders that only make auto loans and lenders that make um, loans other than auto loans to kind of test whether this is being driven only by, for example, um, dealer affiliated um, sort of um, vertically integrated lenders or others. Um, we seem to find that the effect holds in both groups. Um, we do a split by lender size. I'll leave um, this to the paper, but this sort of suggests that the effect is larger for lenders active in smaller areas, um, but is present for large and small lenders. We have a discussion of alternative explanations in the um, paper, and then we have a number of other robustness checks. But um, just to conclude, we find some evidence basically that concentration has a kind of counterintuitive effect on subprime um, interest rates in the subprime segment. And then the way we rationalize this is with the screening model, showing that basically when lenders are making fixed cost screening investments, um, this can actually lead interest rates to be higher in subprime consumer populations. Um, we show some evidence um, suggesting that this relationship is pretty robust. Um, it holds up when we use quasi-exogenous variation in market structure. And we show some other suggestive evidence from uh, things like default rates, loan quantities, screening investments, suggesting that really something like the channel we're talking about in our model is at work. And really the conclusion from this is we may need to rethink the effects of competition in credit markets. The sort of simple conclusion that more competition is better may not hold for some segment of the US auto loan market. All right, I will stop there. Thank you very much. We have a couple of minutes. Maybe if we can give if we can give short answers. Uh, let me try to some of the easy questions. Uh, the hard ones they probably can ask you directly by email. So the first one is about data. Uh, is interest rate observed or inferred? So how we get interest rates is that in the credit report data, we see loan term and scheduled payment. Um, and then we can use, use those two to back out interest rates. So, so is inferred. Yeah. Uh, so, so in some cases, you're going to have missing, missing loan terms. So, so I guess you're going to have some potential problems. Uh, the next one is uh, competition among among auto lenders versus competition among uh, dealerships. So how do you address that? So what we compute in our data is because we use credit reports, we see any lender that shows up in a credit report. So we should be able to see, we should be seeing all of the dealerships, uh, banks, credit unions, dedicated auto lenders. We compute um, concentration measures within credit score buckets, but pooling over all of the different kinds of lenders. So we do not, in our concentration measures, um, treat these two differently, except insofar as they're active in different consumer subpopulations. That said, we do a split where we see whether this affects rates differently by um, what look like dedicated auto lenders versus um, banks that make other kinds of loans seems to have the same um, side effect for both. Yeah, so I think one thing that I missed in your presentation is a more a complete discussion of uh, you know your concentration and market and all this, which you know probably would lead you to maybe a long discussion. But I think that's important in order to really understand the rest. So you might want to think about that for future presentation. Uh, anyway, we are out of time. Great, uh, you know, great uh, paper. A lot of things to think about. Uh, uh, questions might be directed directly directly to you. Uh, so thank you very much. And uh, so let me move to the next presenter, uh, which is David Law from the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. 
uh, and David is going to talk about an auto lender law. I'm sorry, auto dealer loan intermediation, consumer behavior and competitive effects. Thank you and the floor is yours. Hi everyone, thank you all for coming. I want to thank the organizers for putting together a fantastic conference so far. Um, this is joint work with my friends Andreas, John and Toby. Um, these expressed are our own and not those of our employers. I want to start with a basic observation. Um, most auto loans are intermediated by auto dealers. Um, that's well known, I think, by most of you. If you work in this space, it becomes to be a pretty familiar fact. But if you think about it, it's a little bit funny. Uh, you don't typically get your mortgage, for example, from the person you buy your house from. So we want to think um, about one very basic question. We want to think about how does this interme intermediation affect consumers? So I'm going to motivate this uh, very quickly. Um, some facts that many of you know or have has been said before. So first, auto loan market is quite large, third largest debt market in the United States. Um, most cars are bundled with the, the loan that finances them. So around 85% of car loans are intermediated. Um, bundling is a very important profit source for, for dealers. Uh, we found that in um, a site from 2011 that over half dealer profit is comes from financing and insurance. Um, and there's a presentation yesterday, um, Nick from McKinsey um, gave a much higher number than that. So it's a very high number. Um, so even if, uh, if you're interested in auto loans, you should absolutely care about this. Even if you're not interested in auto loans, um, or interested in more than auto loans, um, this does happen in other markets too. So um, consumer durables, such as refrigerators and TVs are often sold along with financing and warranties. Um, Flights and hotels are often sold with uh, travel insurance. And new construction homes, if you buy a home from a developer instead of um, an existing seller, um, new uh, property developers often try and steer you to work with their preferred lender. So it does happen in other important markets as well. Um, so let me briefly go over what, um, what I'm gonna talk today about. Um, so first I'm gonna describe the auto loan market um, and, and pay particular attention to dealers incentives in this market and the vertical relationships between lenders and dealers. Then we're gonna use the dealer's incentives in this market to study consumer behavior. So what's important about this part of the project is we're gonna only impose that um, sub supply side optimal behavior. We're gonna assume that dealers are acting rationally and what can that tell us about consumers? And what we're gonna show is that consumers respond much less to the price of a loan than to the price of a car. And then we're going to go over um, various interpretations of that result. There are some uh, potential explanations you might be thinking of, such as uh, sales taxes. Um, consumers might be impatient or credit constrained. Um, it might be something about default or prepayment risk, and there could be um, something about how dealers and lenders interact with each other. Those all um, seem plausible ex ante, but we, we're going to show that they're not um, viable explanations for what's going on. There's one important explanation that we can't rule out, and in fact, we find some some support for is that um, consumers are reacting less to loan prices and the car prices because they're uninformed or you know un unsophisticated in some way. And then um, we're not going to take a, a specific stance on, on why consumers are acting the way they are. Um, we're going to take two stances. One is that um, they are uninformed or unsophisticated, and this does not reflect their, their real preferences, or we're going to assume it does reflect the real preferences, or we just don't understand why. With those two assumptions, we're going to move forward and impose um, uh, some um, demand side assumptions and an equilibrium model, and we're going to compute counterfactual exercises in a formal model and get some results there. So let me start by describing the market. Um, I wanted to start by saying that this is uh, everything we say is about prime consumers. We, we studied prime consumers in this paper. Uh, some prime consumers are a whole nother ball game. Um, so the typical financing process for a prime consumer is a consumer. Um, this is obviously um, typical, not always. Um, but the consumer chooses the make and model of the car, um, and then it goes into the back room with the dealer. And the dealer checks the consumer's credit, and then um, collects what are called buy rates from lenders um, through um, a centralized system. So dealer tracks a popular one. So, you know, how does that work? So the dealer just puts in this information. The consumer wants to buy, you know, this car. Um, it's got this mileage on it. This is the price. This is the down payment. And this is the consumer's information. And then a bunch of lenders will um, 
respond and they'll, they'll offer what are called buy rates. So, for example, uh, Wells Fargo might say, I'm willing to fund uh, this consumer with this loan at uh, 500 basis points. An ally might say, um, I'm willing to fund this loan for 600 basis points. And the dealer um, looks at all these offers and chooses one to work with. For example, the dealer might, you know, say, you know, uh, I'm going to work with Wells Fargo. They're offering um, 5%, but you know what? I'm going to tack on a markup of 100 basis points and I'll offer the, the consumer 6%. And then if the consumer takes this, um, then the dealer receives a payment that's often called the dealer reserve from the lender. Um, what's important about our data is we observe all these things. So we observe markup, we observe buy rate, we observe dealer reserve. Um, what we find is that payment is very often um, a, a fixed payment that the dealer gets from the lender, no matter what the markup is, plus some constant share of the, the revenue generated from the markup. And in our data, uh, the average fixed payment is about seventy dollars, and the average share of the markup revenue that the dealer generates through loan markups is about seventy-five percent. In our data, about almost eighty percent of loans are marked up, and the average markup is about one hundred eight basis points. So markups are very common and they're very large. So next, I'm going to use um, the dealer's pricing problem to quantify how consumers respond to these two different prices, the price of the loan versus the price of the car. Um, so I'm going to start off with a, a very basic question to build up some intuition. Um, so why do dealers facing these incentives, why do they mark up loans at all? Imagine you're a dealer. Um, your job is, in, is to generate as much profit as you can. You charge the consumer another dollar. Uh, on the price of the car, you get to keep another dollar. That seems great. But if you charge a consumer another dollar on the price of the loan, you only get to keep 75 cents of that, and the other 25 cents you have to give to the lender. So if there is some just amount, um, X dollars that the consumer is willing to pay for the loan in the car, why not just charge them X dollars for the car and charge zero dollars on the, on the loan? Um, well, our answer to that is very simple. Some consumers respond less to the finance charges. So if you try and squeeze another dollar out of them, and the price of the car, they'll say no. But if you try and squeeze another dollar out of them on the price of the loan, they'll say yes. And then you get to keep 75 cents. And that's 75 cents you wouldn't have otherwise. So that's that's the intuition we're going to um, put into a formal model. And this is um, a simple one period model. Consumer provides a down payment, D. Um, they have to pay um, P for the, the price of the car, and they have to pay an interest rate, R. Consumer's disutility of, of paying price P for the car is P. Um, we think of that as a numerator good. The consumer's disutility of finance charges X. The, the one weird thing about this model is we're not going to assume um, the disutility of finance charges is X. So um, we're just going to say that the, the disutility of finance charges X is some arbitrary function M. And we just have to assume um, that M is twice continuously differentiable. But beyond that, we're going to impose um, no structure on it. Um, we're going to assume the consumer requires some utility, um, U bar, to buy the car. Um, so we're very agnostic about what U bar is or where it's coming from. Uh, this is not a model of the dealer screwing over the consumer. And in particular, the consumer, you know, UI could be very high. Consumer could be getting um, a great deal. Consumer could be very happy. And the dealer could be earning no profit. Um, so, you know, it's not a model of, the dealer screwing over the consumer. This is a model of the dealer choosing how to price um, the car and the loan to the consumer. So it's a, uh, it's a model of, of the price P of the car and the price R of the loan. Um, and the consumer can also um, finance the car through the dealer, but they also have the option to go um, finance the, the, the car directly with an outside lender. What does the dealer do? Well, the dealer faces an exogenous buy rate. So a lender tells, um, the dealer, I can provide this loan, fund this consumer for um, some buy rate B. The, the, the dealer also has to uh, pay uh, the manufacturer C for the car. And, you know, facing this buy rate and this cost of the car, um, the dealer chooses the price of the car to the consumer P and the price of the loan to the consumer R to maximize profit. And just like in our data, the dealer reserve has a slope alpha. That's the fraction of the, the loan markup revenue the dealer gets to keep. And there's an interceptum beta, which is just a fixed payment the dealer gets from the lender. So that's the model in English. Let me briefly go over the model in math. Um, the dealer chooses uh, the interest rate R and the price of the car to the consumer P to maximize profit. The top line is profit. So the, 
PI minus CI, that's the price of the car to the consumer minus the price of the car to the dealer. So that's the total profit the dealer gets from selling the car directly. The next term together is, is the profit the dealer gets from um, markup revenue. So PI minus DI, uh, price of the car minus the down payment, that's the total loan amount. RI minus BI is interest rate minus FI rate, which is just the markup. So loan amount times the markup is the total revenue or profit generated um, from markup. And the dealer gets to keep alpha of that. So that's that term. And then the, the final term, just beta, is just the fixed payment the, the dealer gets from the lender. So the top line is profit. The dealer maximizes profit subject to some constraints. Um, the first constraint is just the, uh, the consumer's participation constraint. So um, the dealer has to give a certain amount of utility to the consumer and utility member is just um, basically the price of the car plus um, the disutility of, of the loan and so by. Um, the second constraint says that the, deal, the consumer, or the dealer acts as if the consumer has to get the loan from the dealer. Um, um, so the disutility uh, M sub I of getting the loan from the dealer um, can can only must be at least as high as the utility of getting it from somebody else minus search costs. Um, and then the markup um, must be not negative, and the price of the car must be not negative. So that's the that's the simple model, and um, we can get a lot of traction out of it. Um, unfortunately, today I don't have time to go over any de details or proofs, but they're in the paper. Let me just um, break down our results for you. The first result is that the size and frequency of markups in the data are just not consistent with M of X equaling X, meaning um, we can tell you that consumers do not act as if um, paying a dollar for the car is just as bad or as, as paying a dollar for the loan. They act as if um, they are more sensitive to the price of the car than the price of the loan. But I can go further. Um, so we established there are observable bounds. Um, first on the marginal, this utility of finance charges in prime. Um, and then on the difference between finance charges and the overall total disutility of finance charges, which I'm going to call the O, O for overall. And also, finally, the difference between markup charges and the disutility of markup charges. So we observe these for all the, all the, all the deals, the loans in our data. So that means I can tell you what they look like. Here's the summary statistics of what they look like in our data. So the left-hand column is the mean. So mean MI prime is 0.86. What does that mean? That means the average consumer in our data who pays a markup um, acts as if um, they are willing to pay a dollar more in finance charges to reduce the price of the car by only 86 cents. Um, but that, again, that's a that's a marginal measure. So maybe you're more interested in, in total measures. That's what BO does. So a, a BO on average is um, about $380. That tells you that on average consumers who get marked up in our data are acting as if they perceive um, total finance charges to be $380 less than um, actual finance charges that they're paying. And finally, BM, um, and unlike the other two, we can compute this for all consumers in our data, um, including those that pay zero markup. Um, but so the average consumer in our data is acting as if they um, perceive um, the charges they're paying through markup to be $96 less than the charges they're actually paying through markup. So these are large numbers. And consumers are um, deviating pretty substantially from what you might write down in the traditional model in which consumers are indifferent between loan and car charges. So let me go over some potential uh, interpretations or explanations for our results. One is sales tax. Um, obviously, consumers should respond less to uh, loan prices than car prices because they don't pay sales price on loans. Um, that's, of course, true, but it's not relevant here because we've actually done all the calculations um, already accounting for sales tax. So that's not part of the story. What about um, default risk? Well, this is one reason we focus on prime consumers. Um, uh, we focus on consumers with a credit score of 720 or above. Um, so the default risk is really minimal. So default risk is not important here. Um, but there's four other interpretations I wanna walk you through. Um, first, it could be um, credit constraints or impatience. Maybe consumers are paying high interest rates just because they're credit constrained or impatient. Um, it could be prepayment risk. It could be um, dealer and lender cooperation, or it could be suboptimal consumer de decision making. So let me walk through these. First, what about consumer impatience um, or constraints? There's um, common intuition in economics that's usually correct. It says that um, consumers who are more impatient or who are or are constrained will be willing to pay higher interest rates. Um, in many contexts, that argument works, but it doesn't actually work here. 
because auto loans have fixed payments that fully amortize. Um, so let me just work you through a, a silly example. Suppose total costs for a 72 month loan are $36,000. Then the consumer pays, you know, uh, $500 a month for 72 months. If the price of the car is $1 and the interest rate is whatever absurd number it gets the loan price to 35,999. But the consumer also pays $500 a month for 72 months. If the price of the car is 35,999 and the loan price is just $1. So, you know, as a consumer, the consumer's patient, which of these two should he prefer? Doesn't matter. If he's impatient, which of these two should he prefer? Doesn't matter. The division of, of the cost between the car and loan has no effect in this payment schedule. And this payment schedule is what a typical consumer and a typical model would care about. Um, so, what this means is that impatience and constraints don't affect the, the price, the car price, loan price trade off. So, they really don't explain what's going on. What about prepayment risk? Maybe consumers don't mind paying high interest rates on loans because um, they know there's a chance they'll prepay the loan. And that's certainly true. Um, prepayment risk does mean markups or lower costs for consumers. Um, but the flip side of that is it's a lower benefit for dealers. So dealers, um, the they, their contracts with lenders stipulate what's, what's, what's often called a, a clawback period. So if the consumer prepays the loan during the clawback period, which is typically um, between three and up to six months um, of the first six months of the loan, um, the dealer has to refund the entire dealer reserve to the lender. So the dealer um, bears a substantial amount of prepayment risk. Um, and that actually makes this puzzle even more difficult to explain. So, you know, these two um, forces are, are counteracting each other. So it's kind of an empirical question, which one dominates. And we can look in our data. And if we look in our data, um, Consumers who are more likely to prepay their loan um, act as if they, they perceive a smaller difference between the finance charges they're paying and the actual finance charges, um, which is precisely the opposite um, of what you'd expect if this were just um, a lower cost for consumers story. So, you know, that could just be because the second bullet point is, is dominating the first. But I, we, we think there's also um, another part of the story is that um, Dealers care about prepayment risk, just like you might think they would, but consumers actually don't care about the total cost of a loan through the entire life of the loan. Just they're just focused on the monthly payments, and because um, auto loans fully amortize, the only difference between looking at monthly payments and the total cost of the loan over the course of the loan is you don't look at prepayment risk. So we think um, that could be a significant part of what's going on here too. Let me jump to dealer lender cooperation. Maybe. Dealers are marking up loans not to make money themselves, but to increase um, lenders' profits in exchange for future favors from those lenders. Um, so we can look at this. So uh, markups are on average just three basis points higher for lenders that finance more than 20% of a dealer's sales um, compared to those that finance less than 1%. There's actually like almost no relationship at all in our data between how important a lender is to a dealer and the markups in the data. So there's, 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 we can't find any support for this argument. What about suboptimal consumer decision making? Um, so there were a series of class action lawsuits between 2003 and 2006 against um, dealers and lenders um, around the institution of deal and markup. And a frequent um, complaint from the plaintiffs was that um, dealers and lenders were using um, this um, to extract money from consumers, and, and that consumers were making mistakes and agreeing to these markups. So one expert witness on um, one of these cases testified, standard industry practice is to avoid alerting the customer that the dealer has the ability to control the customer's price of credit. This is particularly successful when used in conjunction with the sale of an automobile because the credit applicant's attention is naturally focused on the price of the automobile. So we think that that's a pretty strong um, expression of, of, of this argument right there. The CFPB, uh, where I work, the FTC, the UK's Financial Conduct Authority and the Center for Responsible Lending of all public studies with some supporting evidence for this explanation. Um, so, you know, we, this is not something we can prove or disprove with our data, but it is something we can look at. So, if we want run some regressions um, of these bounds we've calculated, um, B, B O, for example, um, and we include as controls the average years of education the consumer's uh, county or the internet access quality, and the consumer census tract, what you see is that consumers who live in areas with more um, education or better internet access um, act as if they perceive um, charges more accurately. 
the consumers who live in places with worse education and worse internet access. So that's certainly consistent with this explanation as well. But as I mentioned at the beginning, um, that's where we're going to leave that discussion. And, and, and um, for the final part of this, this project, we're going to proceed with, with two assumptions. One is that this is suboptimal consumer, uh, consumer decision making and that consumer preferences are really what you might expect, that they care equally about finance charges and car charges. Um, we're also going to say, you know, maybe, maybe this is real. Maybe consumers are acting the way they want to act. And for whatever reason, they really do prefer to lower the car, car price more than the loan price. So let me, um, with the little time I have left, talk about our full equilibrium model. Um, and obviously, I don't have time to do this model um, much justice. I'm going to go over it extremely quickly. The details are in the paper. Um, so this is a BLP model um, of, of differentiated project products and Bertrand competition. Dealers are going to set the prices uh, for the vehicles and the interest rates for each model. Um, lenders are going to compete for the loans. And up until now, we've been very agnostic about where uh, about M sub I, um, the, the consumer's disutility of finance charges. But now we have to write down a functional form for it. So we do that now and we estimate it separately in our data. Um, so we estimate the full model using market share data from auto count. And we're going to define a market as a county on average of seven dealers per county in our data. Um, and then we're going to use this full model uh, to run two counterfactuals. And the first counterfactual, which we call the no wedge counterfactual, we're going to make, wave our magic wand and make consumers act as if we, we or standard economists writing down a model might think they should act and, and treat finance charges um, the same as, as uh, the, car, the price of the car. And our second counterfactual, um, which is probably a bit more policy relevant, uh, we're going to take away dealers' uh, discretion to mark up loans. So dealers are just going to take interest rates as given. They're going to pass the buy rate on to consumers. And what that means is that lenders, when they choose the buy rate, are really choosing the ultimate interest rates paid by consumers. And this is going to have two effects in the model. Um, the first is probably more obvious lenders have less information about consumers, so there's less um, price discrimination going on. Um, but the second is uh, very similar to an effect um, in this literature that's often called double marginalization. So when the dealer chooses both the, the price of the car and the price of the loan at the same time, they internalize that if they increase the price of the loan, that kind of reduces the amount that can charge the consumer for the car, which is you know one fourth that kind of um, tamps down total prices. But if you remove um, the, the ability uh, to price the loan from the dealers, the fact goes away. Um, and you know, lenders know um, that if they increase the price of a loan that de decreases the price of the car, the dealer can, can charge the consumer, but the lender doesn't care about that. Um, so this effect can actually hurt consumers. So the, the effect is um, theoretically ambiguous. Let me just go over the quantitative results from these counterfactuals. So the leftmost column um, not highlighted is the baseline, the, the base model. So the, the gray columns are from the no wedge counterfactual. The left no wedge um, column is just the numbers themselves and the right uh, gray column is the percentage change from the baseline. Um, so under the no wedge counterfactual, remember we're um, in this counterfactual, we're, we're making consumers act as if, you know, a standard economist might think they should act. So they're treating they're acting as if um, um, the disutility from um, paying for the loan is the same as the disutility is paying for the car. Uh, if you do this, the total price that paid by consumers goes down about half a percent. And, um, the price price of uh, cars goes up by more than 1.6%. So dealers um, find it harder to charge consumers for, for loans. They find it harder to mark up loans, but they need to make money somehow. So they respond by increasing car prices. Um, but interest rates fall um, quite a lot, as you might expect. The next two rows are consumer surplus. Um, so the first consumer sur surplus row, row hat, um, that's assuming that whatever consumers are doing in the data is actually best for them. So they really, for whatever reason, um, we're leaving unspecified, they really do care less about the price of the loan than the price of the car. And even if that's true, um, making consumers act as if they cared as much about the car and the loan or as, as much about the loan as the car um then make then doing that still raises consumer surplus by more than 1.6 percent um that was initially surprising uh, i think it's an interesting result the reason um it comes about is um a bargaining power kind of story 
um, think about um, you're in the desert, you're really sweaty, and you see someone with a bottle of water, they see uh, you're really sweaty and you're in the desert, um, so they charge you 100 bucks for the bottle of water. Um, even though you're really sweaty, you kind of wish you could act or appear as if you weren't sweaty and you didn't want that water so bad, and then maybe you just pay $2 for it. Um, so that's, that's where that's coming from. Um, but then you see in the next row, consumer surplus with row equals zero. That's if um, consumers, um, were to, the way they're acting in the data does not reflect their true preferences. Their true preferences are just to minimize the total costs, in which case they should care about the, the price of the loan and the price of the car equally. In that case, making them act as if they care about the price of the loan and price of the car equally improves consumer surplus by more than 4%. So the other counterfactual is very similar in spirit, but more policy relevant. This is no dealer discretion taking away the ability of dealers to mark up auto loans. Um, you see all the uh, the magnitudes um, on these coefficients are pretty much the same. Um, the signs are certainly the same. So total prices go down, car prices go up, interest rates go down by a lot. Um, and importantly, consumer surplus increases um, no matter which of these two stories is true. So let me just wrap up. Um, so we use um, the contracts between dealers and lenders to quantify buyers who disposed utility for the loan um, versus paying for the car. Um, we find that the average disutility from finance charges is at least three hundred dollars, three hundred eighty dollars less than than cost. Um, we also uh, find that the, the difference between disutility from finance charges and the cost of finance charges is larger for consumers with lower income, lower credit scores, lower education, and worse internet access. Um, we construct this. Um, IO model and use it to run two counterfactuals. Um, and with these counterfactuals, we find large decreases in prices and large increases in consumer welfare, whether or not consumers actually care less about finance charges and vehicle charges. Thank you all very much for your time. Thanks to the organizers, and I look forward to the questions. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting. Uh, there is a bunch of questions. I'm just going to try to bundle them. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess the first one is re regarding policy recommendations. And, uh, you know, do you have anyone in mind? And some people in the chat have suggested maybe stronger disclosures, whether that might, you know, might help, uh, you know, make things better for consumers? Sure. Um, so, I mean, one policy relevant um, recommendation we have is, I mean, again, not speaking for employers, just for us, is that the, the no um, DOA discretion kind of factual definitely increase consumer welfare. Um, in terms of um, disclosures, um, something like 90% of consumers in surveys uh, favor requiring dealers to tell consumers um, the best interest rate they find. Um, we think that would go uh, probably a long way towards uh, resolving some of the issues around dealer markup. Um, and, you know, in, in the scenario in which consumers, whatever we're seeing in the, behavior, in the data is actual um, reflection of their true preferences. They really do care about less about loan prices. It won't hurt anyone to, to provide this disclosure. Um, so, you know, we think that could probably help some kind of basic fact like that. I, I you know, I, I'm, I don't do research on disclosures, but the research I've seen is that disclosures need to be simple to be effective. Um, so telling consumers that the dealer has the ability to control your price of credit might be very, very helpful. So there, there is some research suggesting that uh, borrowers care more about monthly payment mm -hmm. and not so much about you know their aspects. So how is that related to what you find? Um, so, so that um, as I uh, briefly discussed earlier, that is one reason that you know to maybe. Um, not believe so strongly that prepayment risk um, could be explaining our results. So that's one reason we don't believe prepayment risk explains our results. Um, but if that were all it was, if someone just cares about monthly payments, they should um, they shouldn't care like uh, increasing the price of the car versus increasing the price of the loan by one dollar. They they have the same effect on monthly payments um, because you know you take the total cost of the finance vehicle over the course of the loan and divide that by the number of months of the of the loan. That gets you your monthly payment. Um, so consumers should be minimizing total costs. They should be minimizing monthly payment. Um, in our models, those two things are equivalent. So just minimizing monthly payment should um, 
by itself does not explain this. So, uh, you know, you present the one shot model, and that might have some implications maybe for your conclusions or maybe for the interpretation of your conclusions. Uh, for example, you might think about the more kind of a two stage models where the first stage, mm -hmm. you know, uh, there is the decision of the price and there is more competition in that stage. And then in the second stage, there is the interest rate negotiation and there is less competition there. And that might change some of your interpretations, no? Um, I mean, so uh, the market setup is 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 endogenous. Um, so um, dealers often try and establish like a price for the car before they go into the back room because they want the consumer to think that the price of the car is established before they go in the back room and talk about loan prices. Um, we think they're certainly doing that for a reason. They're 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 uh, doing it so the price of the car isn't revisited. Um, but of course, you can negotiate the price of the car in the back room. Um, we just don't want consumers to think they can. Um, it's certainly very plausible to us that. Uh, Prices, uh, car prices are much more salient to consumers um, than loan prices, and also it's much easier for a consumer to find out, you know, for example, what's the cost of, of, of a Honda, you know, with this mileage on it, you know, this year, than it, um, because all, con like, any consumer buying that car can, can pay that price. Um, it's much harder for a consumer to find out, like, the interest rate they should pay, um, because interest rates are, are, are consumer specific. Um, and just because I can get a loan at a price doesn't mean you can get along with that price. Um, so that, that could absolutely be part of what's going on. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, any additional questions, they can be sent directly to you. Uh, very interesting, thank you. And we're gonna move to the next speaker, uh, next and final speaker, uh, Pamela Fohe uh, for, from Yeshiva University. Uh, she's gonna talk about consumers declining power in the fintech auto loan market. Uh, the yes, uh, thank you so much. And thank you to all the organizers um, for including my work um, on the trends in the auto lending industry and how they impact consumer welfare. So this is my first time at I'm this conference. I'm sorry, can um, we interrupt you? I think you just have yeah. something covered in your first slide. If you can just, yes, perfect, thank you. Is it is it working now? Yes, we see it. So th thank you for, for jumping in. Um, so this, again, is my first time at this conference. Um, and I've been really delighted to learn from the other experts here and actually to hear from people I've cited in the past. So I think I'm the only law uh, professor. Pamela, we are, we are having the same problem again. Sorry. You, I'm sorry. Is With that, your slides, yeah. You can't see the slides. Uh, now we can. Does that work? Yes. Okay. Um, right, so my uh, my presentation is going to focus on a, a forthcoming paper of mine um, entitled "Consumers Declining Power in the FinTech Auto uh, Loan Market." It's coming out in the Brooklyn Journal of Corporate Financial and Commercial Law, and it's currently on SSRN. So this paper is a lot different than the prior papers you've heard about today. Um, and my presentation will be different because I'm focusing more on the consumer's perspective than an empirical work. And I'm drawing on empirical work and discussing um, what I think consumers are um, experiencing when they go to purchase a car and an auto loan. Um, in many ways, this is a really well put together panel because my work um, follows up on what Anthony and David were talking about from the more empirical perspective. So as a, a bit of background, um, most of my work focuses on bankruptcy, particularly consumer bankruptcy. And the genesis of this paper came from that work, particularly a paper called Driven to Bankruptcy, which focuses on people filing bankruptcy to keep their cars. Um, and as my co-authors and I were working on that paper, we watched the auto lending market break new records every quarter. Um, and so this led me to want to go into an in-depth review of the newer aspects of auto lending, kind of the FinTech part um, that people encounter 
which I argue in the paper decreases people's relative power against their dealers and lenders, which then in turn affects how people end up using our bankruptcy system. Um, and it seems fitting that the, the conference is ending in part with bankruptcy. So this slide um, provides an idea of where I want to go with this presentation. Um, there's three trends in the auto loan market that I want to focus on. And again, when I think about these trends, I'm taking them from the perspective of the consumer, um, which is you know, how I discuss auto loans. The trends are first the intertwining of auto sales and loans, which links up directly um, with David's presentation. Which uh, also Pamela, links I'm sorry, Pamela, I'm sorry. We're having the same problem again. Uh, maybe you have a, a second screen open. Um, I'm sorry that it's not it's not working. I'm actually um, in a remote location, so, so that, I only have one screen. And I'm sharing the PowerPoint. Yeah, do you have like a second app also running? Um, I, I, I have, sorry everyone to all the, the participants. I, I have. Is, there, is, there is no hurry. If you would like, I can, sh oh, there we go. It looks like we can see it now. I was gonna say, I can share the screen if you would like, if that'll make it easier for you. I, I have your you presentation. Know, you have the presentation, um, and I'm worried that this is gonna continue happening since it's going back and forth. So uh, for everyone's sake, um, I'm gonna stop sharing and maybe um, someone who has it can put it up um, and then I can just direct you to switch the slides. Yes, that works perfectly. You can continue talking and we'll bring it back yep. up for you. Penelope. Okay, so so back to that that presentation roadmap, right? So the the first um, the first new feature of the auto loan market that I wanted to discuss very briefly is something that David raised, which is the intertwining of auto sales and loans, um, which links in with the, the second aspect of the market that I wanted to discuss, which is um, new types of auto loans, which is more the, the fintechy platforms that people can use to get both their cars and their loans. Um, and then this links in, I think, with, a, with part of the rise in, um, loan delinquencies and defaults, right? I see the slides, if you could go, just go to the next slide, perfect. But this all um, leads to repossession, which is what pushes people towards filing bankruptcy, which as I'll explain, may be the last place where consumers have some power over their auto lenders. Um, and it's the place that people are going to deal with their auto loans. Which, which leads to the final question, which is that, like, what's next? So I'll end with some thoughts um, about how to help consumers in the evolving market from a regulatory and legal perspective, actually kind of picking up with one of the questions that David was asked. Right, so if you can advance to the next slide, you'll see that, that one of the notable features about the auto loan market now is that it's intertwined with the sale market which is what David described. Um, dealers and lenders are one and the same, or at least they're partnered in some way. And 90% of car buyers get their auto loans through the place they purchased the car. Some dealers have an in-house loan division. Um, other dealers partner with lenders, but uh, a dealer is not gonna sell someone a car unless they have the lender lined up. Okay. And the entire market now is interested in how much money can be made from the loan portion of the auto sale. In fact, they might be interchangeable. Um, and then a sizable portion of money from auto loans also comes through markups at the time of the sale that get rolled into the loan term. And what people see in the end is a bundle of terms that link the loan with other terms such as warranties and trade-ins um, and I think it's unclear to people what exactly they are paying for. And in the end, this allows um, lenders and sellers to sneak in terms that are favorable to them. Right? So favorable that in 2018, um, markups amounted to about $54 billion in extra finance charges. So if you look at this, the slide um, 
it's about 10% of the total amount of auto loan originations in that year. And so if you can advance to the next slide, um, it should uh, bring you to the cutting edge auto loans, right? So the overall dynamics of the market are such that car dealers and lenders, I think, really control it. The dealers set the terms, they create the environment in which someone purchases the car and the loan, which makes it really difficult for a consumer to figure out the universe of terms, including the auto loan portion of their car buying experience. And reviewing all this um, was important because it's the precursor to what I term cutting edge auto loans. I think you'll find some are more cutting edge than others. But the how lucrative the auto loan market can be hasn't escaped um, the notice, obviously, of auto dealers and lenders. So when people go looking for a new car, in recent years, uh, they're more and more likely to use some sort of what I call a platform or aggregator to find that car. This is instead of walking into a car dealership or even walking into a bank or credit union looking for a loan to then take it to the dealership. Um, people likewise might use some sort of platform first before they go into a traditional in-person car purchasing scenario. Which, is used to, which used to be how they purchased cars. So in terms of these platforms uh, and car buying, what you see on this slide likely are companies and advertisements you have seen on TV. And the, the idea of all these platforms is that they aggregate loans for indirect lending and lenders, along with delivering the universe of cars that someone might want to purchase to a consumer. So think like cars.com, CarMax, and Carvana. Right? My, my favorite is Carvana, which I think now is best known for its multi-story vending machines and recently has expanded into the area of purchasing cars from consumers. And although some of these companies have been around for decades or more, they've really expanded rapidly recently. On top of that, um, they have inspired newer entrants in the market. And the newer entrants specifically use FinTech and people's mobile devices um, to get people to purchase cars, also to purchase loans, and these platforms rely heavily on partner networks. So auto sellers and the platform are partnering, partnering with the auto lenders. Um, and the apps often promise to get cars to people regardless of credit, although their clients are the auto lenders themselves. Okay. So these um, dealers and lenders like Carvana and the more fintechy platforms come with a bunch of concerns, and I'm going to highlight three of them. I think the first one is the, the rapidness with which consumers make decisions regarding one of the largest purchasers uh, purchases of their lives. Also one of the most complicated purchases of their lives. If they're on a phone, things can happen really quickly. Okay? The phone also um, comes with concerns about the ability of lenders and dealers to slip in extra fees unnoticed. And these extra fees is where lenders and the dealers, when they partner, make a whole bunch of money. And studies have shown um, that people are less likely to pick up on little extra things that are slipped in on a device rather than on a piece of paper. And then there's also concerns about racial bias that come with lending based on big data and algorithms, which obviously are baked into these platforms. And this all may lead to more expensive loans sold to consumers under a scenario in which they're not able to discriminate that they are getting a more expensive loan. Okay. So the, the car buying platforms are not the only newer entrants into this market. Although this is a conference about um, auto loans, I wanna highlight car leasing services because they're the newest entrant into the car delivery market. And I think you're gonna see them more coming up. Um, so 
these services call themselves auto subscription platforms. They're basically updated Zipcar, except you can have a car for a longer term and you pay more money for that car. Of these platforms, Fair may be the most recognizable. It had a bumpy start, um, but as of uh, about six months ago, it rebranded itself to create even longer leasing services. So FAIR now markets itself as offering multi-year leases on pre-owned vehicles. You as a consumer can get a car month to month, you can get a two-year lease, or you can get a three-year lease. And with these platforms, the longer term car leasing services, the main concern is that they end up costing people the same as they would pay for leasing a car or a car loan, potentially they cost more, but the customer is never actually working towards ownership in any way. Okay. So th that's the new auto, auto loan industry. And if you could advance to the next slide, um, I quickly want to talk about how um, these dynamics overall, as I think everyone on this conference knows, have led to people falling behind on payment and delinquencies and default um, going up. And I suspect that these platforms, which promise to deliver cars to people, no matter their credit score, basically under any circumstance, play a role in that increase. Now, defaults also allow lenders to repossess vehicles under the loan contract. And repossession technology is another aspect of the fintech auto loan market, even if it's an overlooked aspect. Um, so I want to bit spend a bit of time on it as I do in term as I do in my paper. Right, so if you can go to the next slide, um, in terms of lenders being able to get their cars back from consumers, from a legal perspective, um, a really important point about the auto loan market is that it's different from basically any other consumer credit that people take out. So first, the loan is secured, right? Which means the lender can come get the person's car if the purchasers default. And for most people, the only other major secured purchase that they make of this nature is their home. But unlike homes, where there's a lot of ways for people to slow down the foreclosure process, there are effectively essentially no laws that give consumers any right to stop repossession of cars. So in recent years, auto lenders have had the opportunity to come get cars more and more frequently because of increases in auto loan defaults. And then they easily repossess the cars and then they resell the cars. How they do this um, goes along with remote repossession devices. Um, and you can advance to the next slide. Okay. So I think probably everyone on this call um, is familiar with remote deactivation devices, also called starter interrupter devices. They are used um, a lot by buy here, pay here dealers, also subprime auto lenders. For example, one provider said that in 2016, 70% of its fi uh, financed vehicles had these devices installed in it. And the basics are that the lender or dealer which controls the device can disable the ignition switch of the vehicle, preventing it from, start from starting. And there's a bunch of stories out there of these devices being used at really inopportune times. Here it's really important simply to note that this makes repossession instantaneous, which is a lot different than any other consumer loan product. It's unique in the world of secured lending. And then along with this collection ability, there's another unique aspect to car loans, um, which is that lenders that come to get the car usually suggest to people that they, quote, kick the trade meaning surrender the current car and then go out and get a new car, which costs probably the consumer more. Lenders then get the car back um, and they have a market in which they can resell that vehicle, making them even more money. 
So when loans are made, particularly subprime loans, repossession is part of the package, at least we think in the lender's mind. Um, it benefits the lenders to repossess the car at some point and then resell the car. Which brings me to bankruptcy. And if you can go to the next slide, that slide has basics about bankruptcy and cars on it. And um, although I bet you didn't think you'd be hearing about bankruptcy, bankruptcy is really important in the auto loan market. Uh, so as my co-authors and I discuss in this paper called Driven to Bankruptcy, given auto sales and lending dynamics, it might actually make financial sense for people to pay to file bankruptcy to keep their current car once it's repossessed or is threatened with repossession rather than kicking the trade. Right? And I've underlined one key term on this slide, which is the automatic stay. Right? As you probably know, bankruptcy stops all creditor actions against cars like repossession. And then based on what chapter um, people file, there are relatively good ways for people to keep their cars which in essence amount to them coming to a deal with their auto lender to reset the loan and keep the car they currently have, which they probably want to keep right, since they have it in their possession, right, which makes filing bankruptcy a lot of people's leading option to keep their cars. And as we explain in, the, in our paper, there are racial dynamics to this where black households are more likely to file bankruptcy only to keep their cars or with their only main asset as their car than other households. The rub with bankruptcy, though, is that it's expensive. It costs about $1,500 for a Chapter 7 and $3,500 for a Chapter 13. In addition, there is a relatively recent Supreme Court case called Henry Fulton, which resulted in people, has resulted in people having to ask the bankruptcy court for their car back if it was repossessed prior to this for their filing, which my co-authors and I think has reduced bankruptcy's effectiveness in terms of keeping cars. But yet people still are filing bankruptcy and indicating that they're doing so with their car as one of their primary motivations in filing the bankruptcy case. So I have one more slide, which we can go to next, um, which is the final portion of my presentation, which is how to, as I would phrase it, rebalance the auto lending market to put consumers on more equal footing with dealers and lenders. And I think now is a particularly good moment to think about auto loan regulation because the economic fallout from the pandemic presents almost a natural moment for the United States to rethink auto financing and also where cars sit among people's transportation options. And I have two batches of ideas, um, which I detail in the paper. They're also detailed on the slide. The first is to target the auto sale and loan market in its current form. And ideas for regulatory intervention can be drawn from protections that are used as to other consumer credit properties, uh, products. So these typically require lenders to assess people's ability to pay, um, to provide understandable disclosures as was raised by David, to limit fees and other charges that accompany the loan, and then to allow rescission under particular circumstances. Now, I think these are good idea or ideas, but I think there's a problem with these ideas in that they don't necessarily work in a market where people really, really need a car, uh, similar to the payday loan market. What will happen is that people on the edges, those who take out subprime loans, will accept basically any terms that are offered to them because they need the car, which in turn may lessen or negate the regulations. So another academic, Adam Leventon, who's at Georgetown Law, who as far as I know is the only other legal academic who's really studying the auto loan market, um, has proposed a, a way to decouple 
the auto sale and auto loan decision. And I have a site for his paper on the slide. Right? And I, I think his idea of decoupling the decision making is a start um, and better than what has been done in terms of other consumer credit products as can be applied to auto loans. But I still think it's not gonna go far enough because people just need their cars so badly. So the second batch of interventions that I have on this slide is uh, are definitely more radical, but I raised the idea of some sort of direct government intervention in the market, some sort of public back loan or some sort of direct subsidies. So I see that there's basically four minutes left. Um, so I'll stop there and I'll, I'll open it up to questions. Thank you very much, Pamela. Uh... So, as you know, there is a over representation of economies here. Uh, so they are always thinking about on the one hand and on the other hand. So some of the recommendations that you have made might also have uh, implications. Uh, for example, uh, you know, uh, the GPS device in a way reduces the cost of repossession, which you know, in a perfectly competitive market might reduce the cost of lending, you know, or, or for example, the example that you were putting about Carvana, uh, you know, uh, uh, there might be benefits even for people that don't end up buying in Carvana. Uh, and I can, I can speak for myself just, you know, if I go to buy a car, I probably would look at Carvana just as a, ceiling for for the price that I want to pay, you know, not necessarily thinking of it as, um, you know, as, as a place where I want to to buy. So, so, you know, so this kind of partial equilibrium, partial equilibrium effects, there is general general equilibrium effects, and sometimes those can go, uh, you know, in different directions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, you make a great point about you know gps device and also that any regulation necessarily potentially could increase the price of auto loans could pre increase the price of the car could increase the price of the entire package um, i i think what i bring to this as um, a lawyer and also someone who's more of a, a sociology trained economist so to speak um, is that you know, people don't necessarily um, react to the, the market in the same terms as an economic model. Right? And people who really need their cars, uh, my, my sense is you know, the, the extra dollar they pay not to have a GPS device in the car that shuts it off and then they lose their car immediately could return to a significant segment of the market that is the most vulnerable in greater fold than the extra cost to purchase the vehicle. Because what people have to do now if they they lose their car is go out and get another car. They potentially lose work, they lose money, they lose their job, and they end up filing bankruptcy. So there's a the whole host of things that are going through that their economic analysis when it comes to both how much they're paying for the car, but importantly, what happens when they default on that loan and the ability for them to reset the loan rather than have the car taken from that. Um, and I love the I love the GPS uh, example because I think it shows it really well. And the Carvana example is also really nice because you and I may look at Carvana and say, oh great, if Carvana is gonna buy my car for whatever, $20,000, that's the lowest I am ever gonna accept for this car. But there is a subset of consumers who think that that is all that there is. And they're leaving a lot of money on the table, which is benefiting dealers and lenders. Oh, I think you're still muted, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there is also the aspect of innovation. Sometimes, you know, uh, it's very hard to measure the value, the future value of innovation. So, uh, for example, some people are talking about in the you know questions about uh, rice shares and how, uh, you know, uh, 
different types of innovations. Perhaps the problem, one of the problems with the subprime sector is that it's relatively small, even though, you know, we talk about, a lot about subprime, but, but in terms of the whole share of the auto market, it's rel relatively small. Maybe what we need is, uh, you know, in incentivized competition. Uh, uh, so I wonder, to, I mean, do you, do you have any ideas for how we could incentivize competition so that maybe the the market itself will, you know, will resolve some of these problems? So I, I think the number one issue or the biggest issue is the intertwining of the deal aspect of buying a car and the loan aspect of the car that you buy and pulling those two apart and creating two different timing scenarios would benefit consumers immensely rather than tacking on getting a loan for the car that you purchase after a very long process and the dealers and the lenders essentially being able to to shove things into the loan um, which is i'll just say again is adam levitin's idea and he spells it out really nicely in his paper including bringing in some psychology research about how people tire as a deal timing goes on and on Uh, so you, you, you were also talking about kind of, uh, you know, the fact that the way we model individuals in economics is as rational, but in the reality, we have more like behavioral individuals. Is there any way that you think the law can maybe move away from the concept of rationality more into the concept of behavioral beings and, you know, short, short attention and, you know, uh, satisfying today's needs rather than, you know, how, how can the law potentially help on that regard? Yeah, I think that's a great question and I like how you phrase it. And since I'm at a conference with lots of economists who do really heavy regressions, my response to you is that you also need to move away from it and to bring more behavioral economics into the papers that you write, because the law responds not only to legal academics who come from a sociology background saying, you know, people are not rational in the way that this economic model is showing, but also the law responds to the economic models and the full papers that people write. Right? So something like what, what David did shows that it, um, people are not responding in the ways that some other models might show and bringing a fuller view into everything that's put in front of regulators, in my view, would be very helpful. So thank you very much, Pamela. I see that Bob is looking at us from the top of the screen. So we should end it uh, here as with other speakers, you know, any questions can be directed directly to Pamela. Uh, thank you very much. I think this is a great paper, a great way to finish a very interesting uh, uh, conference. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much, Jose. Those are some really interesting presentations and thank you to all the presenters. So now we'll hear from Bob Hunt uh, for some closing remarks. Bob is a senior vice president and associate director of the Consumer Finance Institute here at the Philadelphia Fed. And the CFI is one of our sponsors for this conference. Bob's research within the CFI focuses on gaps in our understanding of consumer credit and payments. And by filling in these holes, Bob's research and that of his colleagues can make important contributions to the literature and inform important policy decisions. Bob conducts research on consumer payments, consumer finance, and the, and the economics of innovation. So I'll hand it over to you now, Bob. There we go. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, we've come to the close of our conference. And I think we can all agree this was a fantastic event. Um, we had more than 200 participants register for one or more sessions this year. I, I believe this is our vir first virtual attempt to do this conference, but it tells you something about the, uh, the demand and the interest of this subject. And what the Philadelphia Federal Reserve Bank does especially well is to understand consumer credit. Some time ago, we made a conscious decision to develop our capabilities around auto lending and you see that in the Philadelphia staff that participated in organizing this event and shared some of their, their research, and that's some of the most important investments that we've made here in Philadelphia. 
Another thing that we do well, I think, is to bring together communities that don't often interact or who do not have a place to interact in a candid fashion. And I think we just saw that in our last panel. As you saw yesterday and today, we were able to bring together the views uh, and ideas of people from industry, the broad supervisory community and academic researchers, and not just economists. We also attract a diverse audience, and we feel this cross-fertilization is a force multiplier for what truly uh, what is going on in the market. What are the opportunities and what are the risks? We had a great deal of help from people outside of um, uh, the bank, and we are indebted to our presenters who came from all of these communities to share their thoughts on these days. I also want to thank Jim Naren, Bill Spaniel, and Sunyana Tuteja, who agreed to speak for us earlier today and yesterday. The principal organizers of this conference come from two groups here at the Philadelphia Fed, uh, which you see at the top of the agenda and you've heard us alluding to over the course of the conference. The first one is SURF, our Supervisory Research Forum which is a community of interest in the Philadelphia Bank Supervision, Regulation, and Credit Department. And its purpose is to facilitate conversations and information exchange among economists and policy experts that work on consumer credit at regulatory agencies in the industry and academia. And at SURF, I want to call out Suzanne Schatz, Iris Gonzalez, Jason Keegan, and especially Chelepan Ramasamy, who led the development of the agenda for this conference. The second group, of course, is the Consumer Finance Institute, uh, and that is a bank-wide initiative. By that, I mean we have participation from researchers and analysts in my group, the research department, our community development and regional outreach department, and of course, our colleagues in bank supervision. This represents roughly 60 researchers, not including the 30 visiting scholars that we have dedicated uh, to these fields. So you can count that up, and that's easily two academic departments at most universities. CFI seeks to understand how consumer credit and payment markets affect consumers. Our researchers produce state-of-the-art policy-relevant research available to all, and we convene events such as uh, this. And that is not to say that there are not um, other very important groups around the Federal Reserve System and other agencies, and of course in academia, um, that are doing great research. Uh, it's uh, just simply to mention that this is an area that we have decided to um, uh, grow and invest in, and we're very proud of. We owe huge to members of our public affairs team. This includes Therese Verde, Josh Rivera, Barb Brinko, Sarah Messina, Joey Lee, Emily Janiszewski, and Suzanne Kelleher. And I may have missed some names, and for that I apologize, but I want to thank you just the same. Finally, I want to leave you with this thought. Think back to 2019 when we held this conference the last time and what has occurred since then. The automobile industry has gone through its largest shock since the early 1970s, and probably the greatest pace of technological change in perhaps the last 100 years. And this is coming from somebody who grew up in the city of Detroit 45 years ago. I would never have dreamed of the kinds of discussions we had about electric and autonomous cars that we had yesterday. Similarly, and as we heard today, the auto finance market is experiencing gigantic shocks and that only a decade after the most recent financial crisis. So just imagine what's going to happen between now and 2023 when we next plan to hold this conference. There's going to be no shortage of new developments for us to discuss and debate. And I look forward to um, seeing you all again at that conference and um, continuing this very interesting but also very important conversation. Thank you all.